Start out with a little talent and time for lessons. Add a father who's able to gratify your every whim, and you're likely to turn out to be pretty good at tennis, like Chan Harrington the third. You might even make a tournament golfer. He did. He wasn't bad at polo either. From horses to horsepower isn't a long jump. He made it. When the slopes were covered with snow, Chan knew what to do about them. Skis work in water, too. Chan's father saw to it that his son knew how to handle them. So it wasn't surprising when Chan Harrington III heard about skin diving that father should gratify this urge as well as the others. He hired me to teach the young man how to get along in the underwater world. For the moment, all was serene down here among these magnificent coral formations. I had found Chan to be a strong-headed, willful, arrogant student. I didn't like it. But the beauty of our surroundings had had its effect, and we were enjoying an interval of peaceful coexistence. Now, when I signaled to him that it was time to go upstairs, he decided to argue about it. He had plenty of air left, and he didn't see any reason not to use it. To say the least, I didn't agree with him. He was going up. I grabbed his belt and pulled the release valve on his inflatable rescue pack. That had taken topside all by itself. To speed him on his way, though, I yanked the release on his weight belt, too. Watching him on his way up, I saw that he was holding his breath. He wasn't exhaling the high-pressure air in his lungs as he should have. Apparently, he was determined not to obey the rules of survival, either. It was up to me to make him. I caught up with him just inside. I pushed his stomach hard. That did it. He had to exhale. What are you trying to do, kill me? Try to keep you from killing yourself. Pushing me in the stomach. It was the only way I could make you breeze in a hurry. Air embolus. You remember me telling you about that? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Chad, honey, are you all right? Sure, Kenny, I'm okay, Doc. I am, aren't I? Yeah, through no fault of your own. I forgot, Teach. Don't hang me for just one mistake. Just one? Any time you go down, you make a mistake. I do? Yeah, you do. How? By not obeying orders, for one thing. This time, you didn't come up when I signaled you. I'm sorry, Teach. I'll try harder the next time. Now, don't bother, because there won't be any next time. I'm not going to be your Teach anymore. Tell your father I quit. I'll have my old man send you a check. You do, and I'll shove it down your throat. WM-2050, Mike Nelson. This is Coast Guard Radio. Emergency over. WM-2050, Mike Nelson. This is Coast Guard Radio. Emergency over. That's right, Mike. About 12 miles north-northwest. Get your chart, and I'll give you their exact position. 117 degrees, 49 minutes, 5 seconds west. 
32 degrees. The Coast Guard did have an emergency for me, all right. Radioactive type. Some oceanographers had hit a submerged log. Their ship wasn't sinking, but they'd lost deck cargo overboard. Hot cargo. Two lead insulated cylinders full of radioactive poison. Concentrated phosphorus pouring into the inshore fishing grounds. And I was the only diver nearby. I won't be able to take you in right now. The Coast Guard wants me to dive for a couple of lost tanks. They'll notify you folks. Sounds like fun. Can I help you, Mike? Yeah, by staying out of my way. You should have thanked him. He did save your life. He says it was his fault for pushing me around down there. He might have had a reason for wanting to come up, Chan. You taking his side? I wanted to stay. Well, Jimmy, you get carried away down there. It's a different world. You lose track of time. When I came up to them, the oceanographers I was supposed to help were anchored in 50 feet of water. I thought it best to give them some sea room, so I dropped anchor about 20 yards off. The two scientists rode over and came aboard. Mr. Nelson, I'm Dr. Wilmer. Hi, uh, Dr. Wilmer. My assistant, Mr. Hendricks. Hello, Mr. Hendricks. Mr. Nelson. Nice to meet you. The uh, lost cylinders are exactly like those. Yeah, how hot are they, Dr. Wilmer? Hot? Oh, you mean radioactive. Yeah. Oh, yes, they contain radioactive phosphorus. Its half-life is 14.2 days. After that, it's... Oh, that's uh, long enough time to cause plenty of damage, huh? Yes, it's a concentrated solution of organic phosphate. It could poison fish and anyone who eats it. Oh, our plan was quite safe. Barring accidents, of course. Oh, how do you mean? Well, we plan to dilute it heavily, then release small amounts in mid-ocean as radioactive tracer. Well, what was the purpose? To uh, tag the currents? Only as a means of studying the feeding habits of deep sea life. Well, in that case, I better get down and uh, before they start feeding here, huh? What's the uh, radiation in the water, you know? Well, I tested it. It's not very high uh, on the surface, but it's growing. Uh -huh. Now, the tanks are right down there, and they're leaking. Are you dive? Have you been out looking for them? And Dr. Wilmer wouldn't permit it. Of course not. This isn't like studying crustacea under the Institute Pier. Well, it's only 50 feet. I've checked out that deep with Navy divers. Well, in that case, I'd like you to go along with me. How about it, Doctor? Well, what about your assistant? Yeah, they're just passengers. Well, all right. Get your tank on, huh? We're going to have to use uh, booties and mittens and a, and a hood down there. I got the next one for you. Right. I want a radiation pad, too. You want to fix one of those up for us? Fill it. Hendricks took along a Geiger counter and a pressurized housing. I carried a magnetic metal detector. In almost no time, he reported a reading on the counter. No doubt about it. The cylinders were leaking their poison into the water. Our exposure patches showed that we weren't getting too much radiation, though. Yet. As we neared the bottom, Hendrix's reading held fairly steady. But I started to pick up definite signals from a metal object. They weren't specific enough to guide us to it. I made a finer adjustment to see if that would do the trick. I think that takes real courage. Don't you think they're brave, Chan? Chan! Oh, man, Mr. Nelson didn't say you could dive. Go inside, Dad. The ocean's free. my magnetic detector would pick up the cylinders. Suddenly, I got a loud signal, but in the wrong direction. I picked up a scuba tank, Chan's. I tried to tell Chan to go upstairs. Naturally, he wouldn't obey. 
but he did indicate that he'd keep out of our way. and I decided to split up and try to cover the widest possible area in the shortest possible time. Chan stuck with me. Soon I began getting a sustained signal on my detector, apparently from straight ahead. There it was one of the two radioactive cylinders. Hendricks would know best how to handle it. I wrapped in my tank the signal we had agreed on between us for summoning each other. There was no response. I told Chan in sign language to go find Hendricks and bring him back here. Chan was being a good boy now. He headed out promptly. The cylinder seemed undamaged to me. Even close up like this, my exposure patch didn't show any increase in radioactivity. It had to be the other cylinder. The one that we hadn't found yet. It was leaking so dangerously. came back with Hendricks now. Hendricks checked out the cylinder. I had been right. It wasn't damaged. But the quicker we got it topside, the better. We rigged a buoy arrangement for the trip upstairs. something. Will they come up now? I hope Chan's not in trouble. Chan was still behaving, but he was having trouble. He had used up almost all his air searching for Hendrix, and he'd forgotten to cut in his reserve supply. So I did that for him, and then I ordered him upstairs. This time he went without an argument. Hendricks and I took off to look for the other cylinder while Chan started for the top. Slowly, thank heaven. I could only hope that he'd also remember to breathe out on the way. The signal on Hendricks's counter got louder. Then we saw it. It was pouring out hot tracer. We saw something else, too. Yellowtail, a very popular food fish. We had to remove that poison from this area. Our first job was to stop that leakage, if we could. The trouble was, I wasn't familiar with this particular type of container. Hendrick started to show me how the valves operated. 
trying to move in close, he lost his footing and jarred the heavy cylinder. It lurched loose and smashed down on his arm. The Coast Guard had handed me one emergency. Now Hendricks had given me another. I had to get him free of that deadly cylinder. In doing so, I just about doubled the difficulty of getting the cylinder topside again. Now that was something to worry about later. Hendricks was the immediate problem. His right arm was broken, and he'd been in close contact with the radiation that was still leaking out of the cylinder. He had to be decontaminated, quickly. So did I. As soon as I could rig a sling for his arm, we started upstairs. You have any fresh water? Yeah, I got a hose. Hose Mike off, too. I'm going to my boat and get a medical kit and some chemicals. Coast Guard can take you ashore. Well, what's the hurry? Let me stick around till the job's finished. As far as you're concerned, the job is finished. Now you better go in the cabin and rest till I get here. Okay, then. You better take that suit off, Nelson, so I can decontaminate you. Well, I'm going back down up the other cylinder. You can't. The exposure's cumulative. I didn't get as much radiation as Hendricks did. Now look, Nelson. You don't want me to leave that cylinder down there, do you? Very well. I'll help you. I've used the scuba some. Yeah? How much? Around the Institute Pier. Well, that cylinder is at least 100 feet down now. I'm afraid this is a job for a younger man, Doctor. Besides, uh, Hendricks might need you, huh? I guess you're right. Let me go. I'm a younger man. Now you're too young. This is no kid's game. I'm nearly 20. Well, you don't act it. Too bad, too. You had the makings of a good diver. Are you going down there alone? I have to. The first rule is never to dive alone. You always said so. Oh, you remember the rules now, huh? I'll remember them. It takes two to handle that cylinder. I don't have time to play nursemaid. You won't have to. I won't goof off. It's a hundred feet down there. That stuff's radioactive. I won't chicken out. Now, you'd have to follow orders. You wouldn't like that. I'll follow orders. Well, if you didn't... You could get killed. Follow orders. All right, get your gear off. Okay. Sir. If Chan felt nervous, he had company. The cylinder we were after this time was really hot. And it was in a rough spot for salvage. From a distance, we could see that the cylinder was leaking faster now, pouring out more and more of its deadly radiation into the water. Chan had a fine excuse to quit now. He didn't take it. Maybe because this was the first time in his life that something really important was expected of him. As a matter of fact, Chan was all for pushing right in and grabbing the cylinder regardless of consequences. I stopped him. This was no time for heroics. We had to use our heads. I told him to attach the line to his belt. While I got ready to approach the cylinder in a way that I hoped would give us a chance at least to escape fatal exposure. 
I slipped off my tanks and removed the regulator. For a while, I'd be dependent on Chan's air for breathing. I was going to use my 2,000 pounds of pressure to clear the hot tracer away from the leaking phosphorus tank. Blasted the tracer away. I caught a glimpse of the broken valve. I'd need Chan's help now. He'd have to handle the improvised spray gun while I tried to close the broken valve with a wrench. was jammed open and we couldn't stay close to it for more than a moment because of the radiation danger. The hot tracer kept on streaming out relentlessly. couldn't turn it off. Maybe we could plug it up. I cut off a piece of my harness to make a plug. I need Chan again to spray the tracer away while I tried to insert it in the valve stem. I didn't know if he could stand the gaff. Under the circumstances, I wasn't so sure that I would. Chan did his part of the job like a pro. Luck was with me, too. The plug worked. I was able to reduce the leak to a slight trickle. Now all we had to do was get the cylinder out of there. I'll get the hose so I can decontaminate you. Uh, just in time. Thanks to you, Chan. You should be real proud of him, Jenny. Hey, I'll decontaminate you. I'll take my chances with you, Chan. I'll take my chances, too. Now. Yeah, let me... Come over here, boy. I'll give back to you in a minute. Hi there. I'm Lloyd Bridges. Skin diving is certainly a lot of fun, and it's full of adventure. See some more of it again next week, huh? 
when there'll be another excursion into that fabulous underwater world of sea ice. Destroyers have jobs in peacetime, too. One of them's helping to keep the peace through scientific research. In this case, studying how sound travels under the sea from the Indian Ocean on the east coast of Africa to the Caribbean, southeast of the United States. And that's where we were, aboard a Coast Guard buoy tender 8,000 miles from the Navy destroyer. We included Lieutenant Pete Gregory and Jim Parsons, my diving buddy. Pete was the project officer. My department was troubleshooting. I'm Mike Nelson. As I joined Pete at the control board, I could see that my department was in line for a job right away on the eve of our very first experiment. Something brand new was wrong. Microphone, Mike. It's not picking up a thing. You sure? Go right yourself. Maybe you've got the touch. We better haul him up and have a look. Yeah, but not all the way up, though, huh? Take some underwater? Great. Save a lot of time if you can. I'll go with you, Mike. Okay. All right, take it up easy. Scientists had just announced a startling theory that sound waves travel through a kind of natural speaking tube at the bottom of the sea at an average speed of 840 miles a minute. Supposedly, we had planted our hydrophones at the right level for tapping this underwater RFD, three-fourths of a mile down. How come then that the end of the cable was coming into sight so soon? cut somehow, about a hundred feet down. Rocks had been tied on to compensate for the weight of the hydrophones and the rest of the cable. How and why? the diver come from? No man's land or whatever you call it? Ouija? Yeah. 
It's an orphan. Nobody's ever claimed it. Wait a minute. There's a new military junta in Castania. Yeah, what about it? Well, they've been making noises about redrawing their boundaries and taking a bunch of these little sand springs. Ouija, too, maybe. What do you say we pay Ouija a little visit, huh? All right. Land is right, huh? There it is. Welcome to Castania. Captain Navarre of the Republican Navy, an acting governor of Ouija Island. Lieutenant Gregory, United States Coast Guard. This is Mike Nelson, Commodore and our auxiliary. An honor. But next time I beg you, please request permission to come ashore. Permission, he says. You're on Castanian soil, Lieutenant. And your ship is in Castanian waters. Undeniably, you have been committing espionage. If you persist... What do you mean, undeniably? I deny it. Yes? Come with me. You won't need that. Wait here. Dr. Cole. Yes? What is it, Captain? I'm busy. This won't take long. Dr. Raku, Dr. Tommaso Raku? Yes? I've been admiring your work in oceanography for a long time. Thank you. Especially your studies on the counter Gulf Stream. <laughs> You're a scientist yourself, then? Well, we are on a scientific mission, yes. You are spying. We have proof. Show them, Doctor. We're doing a research job, Captain. Now, your government was notified. Everyone in the area was. Yeah. Our hydrophone. Splendid equipment. Remarkably sensitive. Incredible clarity. Perfect for spying in our territorial waters. That's why we confiscated it. Confiscated? These waters aren't territorial. We're crazy, huh? You are busy, Doctor. Go then. And I suggest you return to your ship and leave this area immediately. My orders are to stay here till these tests are completed. And mine are to maintain Castania's rights. By any action required. I trust you won't find action necessary, Captain. We might be forced to retaliate. Hey, Mike, all set? Yeah. Let's hope they don't uh, confiscate this set. Yeah. How do you figure, Pete? I mean, Dr. Raku working for them. His country, right or wrong? Yeah, I guess that is it. Well, what operation say? Go ahead. And he said, quote, orders unchanged, end quote. Meaning, what are we waiting for? Wonder what their orders were.
No spy catchers in sight, Lieutenant. Lower away. Okay, Mike. Far away. I'm going to follow it down away. Not too far, huh? This camera loses you at 150 feet. Oh, don't worry. That's my maximum without special tanks. They'll probably move in around 90 feet if they try it all. I can get there fastest from below. Okay, Mike, you're the diver. Just watch it, huh? No, there's nothing to watch yet. Maybe there won't be. Out. Roger. Hydrophone's on the bottom now and operational. I'm ready on the destroyers to drop the cans. Out. Charles, this is George. Over. Charles, this is George. Over. George, this is Charles. Over. Manila Bay. Over. Manila Bay. Zero hour. 1425. Now, 1424. Minus 10. Minus 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. Out. It wasn't a secret mission. The code could be broken down in no time. George meant Admiral George Dewey. Charles meant the officer to whom he gave a famous order at Manila Bay. You may fire when you are ready, Gridley. Our Gridley is firing depth charges. Time to explode 4,000 feet down, inside the speaking tube from the Indian Ocean to the Caribbean. If the sound waves went the whole distance, 8,000 miles, at their theoretical average speed of 840 miles a minute, they'd hit the hydrophones and Pete's monitor in an hour and a half. We'd never know unless the hydrophones remained tied to the monitor by cable. They'd cut it once, burned it. I could see now how. They weren't getting a second chance. The cans exploded deep in the Indian Ocean. The sound waves headed west. Their target was 8,000 miles away, a set of hydrophones on the bottom of the Caribbean. The phones were rigged to a topside monitor. My job was protecting the cable from some local fire eaters. They claimed that we were running a spy setup. Way off to, Mike. What's wrong? Frogman at 2 o'clock with something that looks like a flamethrower. Where? I can't see him. They haven't come into camera range yet. Out. It was an underwater cutting torch, special design. Only one man in their team could have dreamed it up, the world-famous marine scientist, my hero, Dr. Rico. wasn't the time to check gauges, but we had to be 200 feet down now at least. Speed swimming only increased my chances of being hit by nitrogen narcosis. 
And that's as dangerous to a diver as laughing gas to a driver on the freeway. Safer, though, than being hit by a blowtorch. Two hundred and twenty-seven feet deeper meant death. The narcosis had hit them first. They were still dangerous, but only to each other. I couldn't let them die, either by burning or drowning. their weight belts. That would take them to the top at a safe speed, too. They wouldn't need any stops for decompression. They hadn't been down deep more than a few minutes. I had been in the danger zone, though, 150 feet or deeper for a quarter of an hour. I would have to decompress. It'd take about 30 minutes. Nothing to it, really. Except uh, I didn't have that much air. Only 100 feet from the top now, but 100 yards from the ship, out of camera and radio range. By the time I got to my first stop, 30 feet down, I'd also be out of air. Rockman, must be the ones Mike spotted. Yeah. Mike, this is Pete Gregory. Mike, this is Pete Gregory. Come in, Mike. Mike, this is Pete Gregory. Come in, Mike. I had to find my way back to the cable and SOS Pete to send down a tank right away fast. Semper Paratus, the Coast Guard motto, always prepare. I believed it now. Should have checked in by now. Phones are working okay. What time do cans go in? 14.25. We're 96 minutes now. Yeah. So I'm speaking to. Well, when it gets to 100 minutes, I'm going to call it a... <laughs> three cans, three booms. Wow. Nice speaking to. <laughs> hey, you know, I got a half a mind to buzz over and tell Navarre and Riku. Yeah, they probably know already. They've got another set of phones. Yeah. Perhaps there won't be any more tests. Tests? I tell you, they're spying. And unless we stop them, they... How? Oh, what can we do? A hydrophone can identify what things they put in the water, can it? Well, yes, within limits. But that doesn't mean I can do anything. If you love your country, Dr. Riku, you will find a way to serve her. The 
next test in our series was to see if sound waves starting 8,000 miles away could set off acoustic mines. We were planting them below the ship, but way, way down, three quarters of a mile alongside the hydrophones. Actually, though, the explosive effect of the mines was nil, farther away than 100 yards. Secure below. Let's hope it stays that way till firing time. There's no problem. Oh no. What if Riku comes up with another torch? They're pulling out. Bag and baggage. Good, huh? Yeah. Still like to know what Riku's angle is. The code word for test number two was Bunker Hill. Sam Adams gave the order to John Hancock. John saw the whites of their eyes at 0916 and fired three depth charges. Uh, nothing to do now but wait 96 minutes for the sound waves to ping against the mines. That would be at or very near 10.52. Dr. Raccoon! 